Lecture 4, Buddhism is Ecology. Thus I have read, one fine day at Vulture Peak in Rajgir, India, thousands gathered around the Blessed One, sages and saints, wise women and men, even the gods and myriad bodhisattvas were there to hear him expound the Dharma, to teach the deep and powerful truths that he had discovered on his path. The Buddha, now toward the end of his career, came slowly forward and sat down in silence. Ananda brought some flowers offered by a devotee and set them down by his side. The Buddha admired the flowers for some time and then plucked one particular blossom and slowly brought it to his heart. Gazing out over a crowd of monks eagerly awaiting his teachings, he wordlessly held up the single flower blossom. After some time, he twirled it slowly between his fingers, continuing to say nothing. His attention and the attention of all who gathered with him fully focused on that flower. Total silence ensued. Perhaps the wind died down. Even the birds held their song. After more time had passed, just about everyone began to feel restless and uncomfortable. No sermons, no pithy maxims, not even an enigmatic riddle, just silence and the flower. The monks started sneaking looks at one another to see if anyone else could figure out just what was going on. Was he ever going to say anything? Some of them started looking off distractedly in the distance, and a few even started talking to each other. All the while the Buddha sat there silently, holding the flower. Most of the audience was visibly bewildered, and many of them dealt with it by talking but a quiet smile appeared on the face of a monk in the back of the crowd, a monk by the name of Kashipa, who from this time on would be known as Mahakashipa. While everyone else was busy being confused, agitated, uncomfortable, or even complaining, he alone sat smiling. He alone seemed to understand the Buddha's silent flower teaching. Buddha finally spoke. In the eye of the true wisdom teaching, the heart of nirvana, the form of no form, and the ineffable stride of dharma, unexpressed by words, it is now transmitted. His administrative successor was found. Much is made of the Flower Blossom Sutra, and there is no clear evidence that the story is even true. But I will offer my interpretation in the hopes that it brings value to you. One of the core teachings of Buddhism is that all things are interconnected. Often called the teaching of dependent co-origination, the Paticca Samuppada is expressed in less technical terms as simply, this is because that is. Thich Nhat Hanh likes to use the example of a piece of paper. Looking deeply into the paper, you can see more than just a piece of paper. You can see the trees and the wood pulp from which the, tr the paper was made. You can see the sun, the wind, and the rain which helped the trees to grow. You can see the loggers and the driver of the truck that brought it to the mill. If you look deeply at a piece of paper, you can see everything that is. I think this is what Mahakashipa saw that day on Vulture Peak when the Buddha sat there silently holding the flower. I think that he saw his smile in that flower. And I think the Buddha saw his flower in Mahakashipa's smile. No reliance on words and letters, direct pointing to the heart, recognition of beauty, realization of one's true self. Others, of course, saw the flower in the Buddha's hand, but what made Mahakashipa stand out is that he did not see a preconceived notion of a flower, nor did he see memory of flowers past, both the Buddha and this monk were able to see, truly see, and fully experience that particular flower at that particular time. So often we look at something or someone and find ourselves looking through so many filters, filters of hopes, fears, memories, expectations, that we never deeply see what we are looking at. Mahakashipa truly saw that flower. And in that flower, he saw the world. All beings, human, animal, mineral, etc., exist in relation to that flower. 
and this may have been the first lecture on deep ecology ever given. Looking into the flower, you see yourself. As Zen Master Dogen may have said, if you yourself cannot develop the power which illuminates the true reality of the flower, who else is going to be able to convince you that you and the flower are one and the same? The goal of Buddhist ecology is much more than an unpolluted environment. It entails a life of simplicity, conservation, and self-restraint. Meditation and the practice of unremitting <clears throat> attentiveness and awareness enables us, actually forces us, to face every moment without the cloak of judgments and preferences. Having mastered this discipline, one is able to confront the most fundamental pollution of all, the pollution of the mind. Zen Master Isai said, because I am, heaven overhangs and earth is upheld. Because I am, the sun and the moon go around. The four seasons come into succession. All things are born because I am, that is, because of mine. Living in harmony with the earth does not happen overnight. It takes years of training and deep spiritual understanding for a person's actions to be instinctively universal rather than habitually self-centered. The fruit of Buddhism, mindful living, creates a view of human beings, nature, and their relationship that is fundamentally ecological. Awareness opens our perception to the interdependence and fragility of all life and our indebtedness to countless beings living and dead past and present near and far if we have any real identity in buddhism at all it is the ecology itself a massive interdependent self-causing dynamic energy event against a backdrop of ceaseless change from Indra's net to the Huyen school, to the Japanese teaching of Esho Funi, life and environment are one, to interbeing as taught by Thich Nhat Hanh, Buddhist philosophy and practice constitute what scholar Francis Cook calls a cosmic ecology. If at a deep level we accept that all phenomena are in essence with our own body, we will treat everything, animate, and inanimate with reverence. Since we are not separate entities, what happens to the universe happens to us as well. Buddhist ecology, therefore, encompasses not just this planet, but the whole cosmos. What affects the ocean affects the wave. Just so, what affects the universe affects each of us, since we and the universe are not independently separate. In a person of wisdom, compassionate concern for the world will instinctively arise. I believe the Buddha's flower was an expression of this universal compassion. The flower symbolized the realization that Buddhism is ecology. Thank you.